How do? Good to have you all here to this afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Wade, and I get the pleasure of introducing to you someone who's lived here for over 24 years. Been extremely active in the community, along with her husband, Dave. They came here to retire, but I'm not quite sure she understands what retirement is. Uh, She's worked many, many hours tirelessly for the community and chairing one of our service and support committees. She was instrumental in forming this committee back in 2005 and has been its one and only chair since that time. This time I'd like to turn the time over and introduce Tempe Johnson. Tempe's going to speak to you for this afternoon and, and about the Neighborhood Pride Committee that she takes great pride in. She gave its name. In addition to that, she says you can just sit back and enjoy hearing about all the things that their committee does and leave with a better understanding of what some of these things are that help make our community great. Would you give her one more hand for a lot of years of service? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, good afternoon. What a nice group of people. And I thank all of you for coming. First thing I was going to do was tell you that the guy in the hat, he said to me, I shouldn't put it on because I'm indoors. That's Mark Wade. And for those of you who don't know, he's our general manager of our community. So thank you very much, Mark. Then we have... I have just one little bit of housekeeping that I would like to ask you to do. I'm sure that the majority of you have a phone, a cell phone, either in your pocket or your purse or in your jacket pocket that you hung on the back of a chair or wherever. I would really appreciate it if you would turn it off at this time so it doesn't ring and startle me to death. Thank you very much for that. So now we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Early last fall, at one of our monthly committee meetings, discussion ensued educating our residents about the NPC, the Neighborhood Pride Committee. Some com committee members knew that several years ago, I gave a presentation to the Garden Club, similar to what I will be doing today. And it was suggested that perhaps we should give the presentation to the entire community. And that is what finds us here today. My topic is, quote, what we see as we tour SCOV. And it pertains to the committee that I chair here in Sun City, Oro Valley, the Neighborhood Pride Committee. But what is pride? According to the dictionary, the word pride is a noun, meaning the quality or state of being proud. We are proud when our children or our grandchildren are young and they do something really great at church or at school. We are proud if our gardens of flowers or vegetation, vegetables, turn out really beautiful and everything looks and or tastes just the way we envisioned it when it was planted. A sense of pride comes along many times throughout our lives and is no stranger to us at this time of our life. Therefore, pride is a word that we all have or take when we say we live in Sun City Oro Valley, a beautiful neighborhood which our committee works tirelessly to keep as such. At the end of our slide presentation, I will be more than happy to take questions or comments from the audience. On the card that some of you got as you walked into the auditorium, you might want to write down your questions as I go along. But please hold them until towards the end when the committee members will collect them. The Neighborhood Pride Committee, or the NPC, was established 14 years ago last November. We are an SAS committee a service and support committee of the Board of Directors. Our large volunteer committee of 20 members 
does what one person was initially hired to do. We look at the entire community monthly to make sure that all homeowners keep their street side appearance of the property in a neat and tidy order, according to the governing documents of our community's master declarations. It's a huge job, one in which we take pride in doing, since we, like you, take pride in living in our beautiful community. The rules of our community are written and amended by the Architectural Review Committee prior to being approved by the Board of Directors. The NPC tours the community once each month, making sure that individual homeowners abide by these rules. For those in the audience who do not know, this is how our committee operates. The NPC, or Neighborhood Pride Committee, operates at the pleasure of the Board of Directors of Sun City Oro Valley. The committee follows its mission statement, which is to promote compliance with the governing documents by individual homeowners in order to maintain property and aesthetic values. In support of our mission statement, the community of 2,488 homes is divided into seven sections with each section being toured once a month by two individuals in a golf cart. The committee members do not leave their golf carts and only note what is visible in yards from the street. Every other month, a list is generated of possible infractions that they observed, and that list is passed on to a second team of two members. At the beginning of the following month, the second team takes the list that they received and goes out to look at only the addresses on the list. If the infraction still exists a month after first being observed, then a courtesy notice is made and turned in to the community services coordinators, CSC. The courtesy notice will then be sent to the residents stating the violation as it pertains to our documents and what needs to be done to correct the infraction by a given date to bring the property into compliance. Therefore, it takes four people to see an infraction approximately a month apart and all four must agree that it exists before any notification is sent to a homeowner. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the case where a home needs to be painted, after four members agree a month apart, the form is written and turned into the office. The co-chairs of the architectural compliance team, ACT, inspect the house to see if they agree. Therefore, it takes six people to agree that a home needs to be painted prior to the homeowner even being notified. If any of the six people do not agree, the courtesy notice is not sent. Different infractions to the documents have different time frames for accomplishment of what needs to be corrected. If the homeowner cannot make the stated date for getting it done, they may call the community service coordinators and ask for an extension of time. If any homeowner receives a notice and doesn't understand the infraction, they may contact the CSC and she, or the chair of the Neighborhood Pride Committee, is more than willing to go to the home, to the property, to show the homeowner about what the notice is referring. It is the goal of the NPC and the CSC to work with the homeowner if they call or email us and let us know how we can help. If that is accomplished, then all the residents in Sun City Oro Valley will understand the rules to maintain their property and they will take pride in living in our beautiful community. At this time, I would like to introduce Katie Moser and Karen Lafredo. Please stand, girls. Our community services coordinators able to reach the homeowner, we then notify administration of the problem, and if the homeowner 
has left a way to contact them while they're gone, a phone call <coughs> or email, excuse me, is immediately sent. <coughs> I don't think it helps to turn around. This one is attached to me. Excuse me. <coughs> you didn't need to film that, Tom. I personally, in the many years of touring our community, have never had people be upset with me when I've called and gotten them up out of bed to tell them of an incident in their yard. Because we sometimes do tour very early in the morning, especially in the summer months. It is much better to find out about an irrigation leak when it's happening than to learn about it after the system has shut down for the day. As you can see, it is important to leave contact information with the office if you're going to be away for a period of time. Your property is your investment, and we are just two more sets of eyes keeping watch on it while you're gone. Now I'm going to wander around for a minute. I'm going to talk about other safety issues, and I'm sorry if my back's going to be in front of somebody's way. I'll keep moving a little bit. This is a palm tree in someone's yard with dead fronds. Dead fronds are definitely a safety issue when the wind blows, because when the wind blows and they fall off, they could injure a walker, or you could have something that happened to me one day when I was driving down Del Webb Boulevard, and all of a sudden a frond flew across in front of my golf cart. It startled me. I jerked the steering wheel. Fortunately, nobody was on the inside lane passing me at the time. But dead fronds are definitely a safety issue. There's another tree that has dead fronds. So when we ask people to cut them off, it is a safety issue. And they do need to be cut down. <coughs> Sidewalks that are raised and damaged are also a safety issue. I'm going to hand this clipper to somebody who can fix a battery on it, with somebody being my husband. Thank you. I suppose you want the battery. What do you mean it's working? It wasn't working for me. I could have hired a clip of a person to hold this thing, I guess. All right, Dave. There. If you're walking down the sidewalk, and you're walking with somebody, <clears throat> and you're not paying attention to where you're going, like most of us don't, because you're talking to the somebody, you could trip on that. You can trip and fall. A, a raised sidewalk is the responsibility of the homeowner whose house it's in front of to fix. If a shrub is taller than 42 inches at the entrance to a driveway, I give up. You work the clipper. I'll talk. You do that. <coughs> a shrub at the entrance of a driveway needs to be 42 inches in height or shorter. If a car's backing out of that driveway and somebody's walking down the sidewalk with a little dog on a leash, the driver of the car might see the person, but isn't going to see the dog. If the person's my height, which is five foot one, they may not see the person. So bushes right at the entrance of a driveway do need to be cut down to at least 42 inches. It's a good idea to cut them to about 36 and let them grow. A tree hanging too low over the sidewalk, and we won't talk about who that is in the picture, obviously that person is five foot tall, um, needs to be seven feet up above the sidewalk so it doesn't hit the walker in the head or blind them because it hits them in the face and cuts them right into their eye. This is a picture of a brittle bush, bush plant extending out over the sidewalk. So if my husband Dave and I are walking down the sidewalk, and he's on the outside being the gentleman and I'm on the inside, who's going to get stabbed by this bush? Me. It needs to be cut back off the edge of the sidewalk. Just as this agave 
is very dangerous sticking out over a sidewalk. This is just another example of a safety issue that my committee will note when they're out touring. Next, where's the stop sign? If you live on a corner and you have a stop sign at the corner and the tree blocks it, that too is a safety issue. For those who live on that street, they know there's a stop sign there. But if we have company or we have a delivery person coming down that street, they may not know there's a stop sign there. And whoops, you've got an automobile accident. Backing up for just a minute to the development standards, which are part of the governing documents, new owners are also given one piece of paper entitled SCOV Property Maintenance Tips. We will have copies of this paper available for you as you leave the presentation this afternoon. And it is from this one sheet that we made the following slide pictures to show you just what our committee looks for as we tour each month because we not only look for safety issues, but we look for other items too. The next picture shows a satellite dish. A satellite dish in the yard, and many of us have uh, direct TV, dish TV, uh, right off the top of my head, that's only two companies I can think of, that throw a dish in the yard, put a dish in the yard for your um, watching of television, and it's not supposed to be visible from the street or a neighboring house. There's a real neat free um, thing that our community does when new homeowners move in or you decide to go with a company that has a dish. If you call the office, call the community services coordinators, they will send somebody out for free from the Architectural Review Committee and they have this little machine about the size of your cell phone, and they'll wander around in your yard and tell you where in your own personal yard are you gonna get the best reception for TV service for your home. They don't charge to do that. So then when the company then comes to put in the dish, you should say to your company person that's there, this is where I want my dish, right here by this bush. Can't be seen from the street, can't be seen from the neighbor's house. I'm gonna get good reception here. Most of the time that works, except the installers are contract people. Sometimes they work directly for uh, DirecTV. Sometimes they're contract people, they're in a hurry. They got a list of 18 places they gotta go in one day. And they'll say, no, no, we wanna put it here. And the homeowner then should say, mm -mm, it goes here. If you have it put where it's seen from the street or seen from the neighbors, my committee's going to see it. You're going to get a letter. And what's going to happen? You're going to have to pay another 50 bucks to have them come and move it where they should have put it to start with. They shouldn't be put on roofs. That can be seen from the street. <clears throat> There's another one in the far back yard, sort of of this particular house. <clears throat> this slide also shows bare soil out near the utility box. Um, the bare soil could have been there for one of two reasons. Either somebody had a bush and they got bored with it and took it out, or some animal decided that was a good spot to dig around and make a mess. Bare spots need to be covered with rock and not just sit there and look like dirt. Here's more bare soil under a dormant bird of paradise plant. This one I'm sure was put there by some sort of little creature that thought that was a good place to come out and dig in your yard. <clears throat> some people are now putting in what's called a mini split. It's an auxiliary air conditioning unit. The people that are doing that are uh, people who may be have a workshop in their garage, they like to work out there and build something, 
or they've added a room to their house, which is not on the central air, so they put this mini split in to um, air condition that particular room. They're allowed, and right now they need to be hidden from view by a bush from the, tree, from the street. <clears throat> I'm gonna back up and say, years ago, all air conditioning units that we all have at each of our houses had to be hidden from view by a shrub. That's been changed in our documents now. We all have air conditioners, so, so be it. Um, the big air conditioner does not have to be hidden from view, but these little guys, which aren't very big, do. Empty pots. Empty pots right now we're ignoring. Why? Because the frost came way too early. And it's killed everything that's in pots. We're not going to write up a letter for an empty pot. And we don't expect you to go out and buy a geranium and stick it in there until spring comes, if it ever gets here. I think it will. Um, not just one pot, but lots of pots. These people just took all their pots and lined them up beside the house. You can't do that either. Let's put them in the backyard or the garage or someplace, not sitting where we can see them from the street. <clears throat> an empty pot is an artifact. Oh, what have we here? This little guy, this little blue roadrunner, actually lives at my house. But he doesn't live in the yard. I put him there to take his picture. He lives behind the courtyard wall. That's an artifact. So are pink flamingos, so are, mm, let me think for a second. So are these solar lights that you see in hardware stores or Home Depot that look like a flower or um, a toadstool or a whatever. And they're gonna look pretty maybe at night when it's pitch dark. We don't go out and tour in the dark. So in the daytime, they're an artifact. They're neat, they're cute. Put them in the backyard, please, not the front. Seasonal decorations are allowed in our community. Um, so many days before um, the holiday, I don't want to drive around in March and see um, this one in somebody's yard. Um, they should be taken down following the holiday pretty shortly after. I will say that Christmas decorations, we use the same rules as Oro Valley. Oro Valley says you can have Christmas decorations up till the 15th of January. So if we get crummy weather the first 10 days of January and you don't want to go out and take down your Christmas decorations, don't panic. They can sit there till the 15th. In fact, we're probably not gonna go out till the first 10 days of February, so if the weather is still crummy and cold like it's been lately, as long as they're down pretty quick after the 15th of January, that's all we ask. This is a picture of more bare soil and deteriorated paint trim. The trim on this house was blue at one point in time. I don't even think that's an allowed color anymore but it's faded to kind of weird looking gray. So it would need to be painted um, a correct color from the current paint schemes. And the dirt in the front, the bare soil, needs rock on it. For sale signs, right now we don't have a lot in this community. Um, and what we do have seem to sell pretty quick. They may have one rider not three. Most of the realtors who work in here on a constant basis know our rules and know that they can't have three riders. I will say that sometimes the one that's on the bottom of this one that says open Saturday might have been put up on a Friday. The realtors know that. They can get by with that. Um, they'll have their open house. If they're realtors that know the rules, that's down the next day. So if you have your house on the market, don't let a realtor put up more than one rider on a regular basis. This is a front light pole, which is obviously oxidized. It's no longer black. It's kind of gray. They don't have to be black now. They need to be either black, 
bronze or weathered brown, not oxidized gray. This is a light, or excuse me, a light pole. It's a mailbox. Maybe I need a drink of water. It's a mailbox that's chipped, obviously needs to be painted. It's also oxidized and gray. If we have a really neat house that costs $200,000 or up, or even $150,000 and up, we don't want a crummy looking mailbox in front of it. It doesn't cost that much to paint it and make it look nice, just like your house looks. So we're going to write up mailboxes if they're chipped or oxidized. They don't have, they need to be black. They don't have to be shiny, black. They can be flat paint. I will tell you that if you choose to paint your box and your post in a flat color, it will oxidize quicker than if you use the glossy paint. But that's your choice. It just needs to be black and neat and pretty. Not like that. Whoops. Now we have a box. Hark, this one's in front of my house too. <clears throat> and it's missing a box on the post. Every post has to have however many boxes the support was built on the post to hold. I know that some of you have three boxes on a pole or four boxes on a pole. In this case, I took this picture deliberately because a truck, and I don't remember now, it was years ago, whether it was a FedEx truck or a UPS or some kind of a truck, decided to turn around and plowed into my neighbor's box and totally destroyed it. So consequently, the neighbor had to go buy a box. Now my box that's in this picture has a flat top. That's what was made when Del Webb built the community. You can't buy them now with a flat top. So when the neighbor went out to buy his box, which now has a curved top, I said, please buy two. And when you get back, I'll pay you for mine. And that way, both boxes on our post will look the same. Meanwhile, I took the picture so that you can see you've got to have a box of some sort on a post. If you have a house number frame, and we all do, some of them are painted the color of the house. That's fine. Some of them were painted white. That's fine, too. But over the years, some of them have faded, chipped, and they look a little on the crummy side. They need to be painted something, um, the color of the house or white. And it's OK that I have this number up here because there's a whole bunch of 14630s in this community on different streets. So I just wanted to show you the frame. This has an awning over windows that is torn. My laser pointer is still working. Thank you, Dave. Um, if you have an awning, that's fine. But let's keep it neat and tidy, not ripped, torn, shaggy looking. What have we here? We have a trash can out, visible from the street and the neighbor's house. I just want to talk about trash cans for a second. Just for a second. Let's pretend Tuesday is trash day. If you put your trash can out Monday night because you don't want to get up on Tuesday morning, that's fine. But don't be surprised if you've got a pile of trash, tr garbage and trash in the street in the morning. That's up to you. You're going to have to clean it up. It's a good idea to not put it out until shortly before the trash man's going to come down your street. And after he comes, let's put it back in the garage behind a wall that you built specifically to hide the can, not just behind a bush, which there it sits, visible to the world. That was not on trash day either when that one was taken. That was two days later. Oh, now we're going to talk about wildflowers. Wildflowers have been um, my, not my nightmare in the last couple months. Mother Nature screwed us up. Wildflowers have not bloomed in previous years that I've lived here 
until March. But because of all the rain we had in January, some of them popped up their heads at the end of January, first part of February. I've got new members on my committee who don't know, who hadn't been through a training session about what to look for when they went out looking for wildflowers. I had it scheduled to train this week, yesterday, when I had my Neighborhood Pride monthly training session. But lo and behold, here they came in March. When they're little like this, or the next slide, what do they look like in a yard? They look like weeds. So to those of you who got a letter for having weeds the first five days in February, I'm sorry. You called Katie, you said, oops, those are wildflowers. Well, I'm sorry my committee didn't know that. It's really, really, really hard to tell what is a wildflower that hasn't bloomed and what is a weed. We do the best we can. We're all volunteers. We mess up sometimes, and we're sorry. So if you got a letter for weeds, and you called us and said, mm -mm, those are wildflowers, OK, we'll clear it. Next slide, please. What are these things in the yard? Are they wheat? They got a little bigger. That's right. Go to the next slide. It bloomed. Once it blooms, we know it's a wildflower. But when it's sitting there just looking like a little bitty God knows what with pretty little leaves, how do we know? So we, some of us who've been around for a while, I knew those were bluebells that hadn't bloomed, but some of my committee members might not have known. I don't know some of those other weeds when they're just little guys about yay big, and they don't have pink or yellow flowers on them yet. That's a learning process for all of us. Here's a yard that has lots of weeds everywhere. Not only in the yard, but in the cracks of the driveway. Obviously, that yard needs to be cleaned up. Grass is considered a weed. How did the grass get in our yards? Well, it got there probably because maybe the house is located near the golf course, where there's lots of grass. And some bird flew by, dropped a seed. Now the yard's got grass in it. We're not supposed to have grass in our yards. We're supposed to have rocks in our yards. Next. Oh, what have we got here? We have something that was very happy to find grass. Um, I think he's kind of neat looking, but the grass doesn't belong there, just like the weeds don't belong there. We have lots of tall grass in that picture. Now we'll go to talk about desert broom. Desert broom, this, this slide, by the way, um, was made off of a piece of paper that's in the documents. It's in, on our webpage, on Neighborhood Pride's webpage. Desert broom has the light green leaves. It grows usually out of the midst of another plant. It's highly allergenic. I'm short, but let's pretend the weed is this tall out of the ground. Maybe that's about 15, 16 inches tall. You should spot it before it gets that tall. But if it's that tall, the root of that weed is half its height. So you've got 8 inches of root down in the ground, and you've got 15 inches of weed up in the air. They're not hard to get out when they're little, if the ground is wet, like it has been lately. But what if you see it in July, and we haven't had rain for two, three months? Get some water, boil it, make it hot, walk it out, pour it on the ground where the weed is, wiggle the reed, weed back and forth, it will come out. You don't want to break the root. If you do, it's going to come back. Keep an eye on it. It will reappear. If you don't get it out of your yard, where's it going to go? It's going to stay in your yard, and it's going to go next door, and next door, and next door. And now your neighbors are going to think, oh my god, where did that come from? So it's time to remove it when it's little. 
I have a couple of pictures of desert broom growing out of a little palm tree right out of the base of the plant that you want in your yard. The next slide shows one that's growing out, it's quite tall, out of a rosemary bush. Every now and then when the weather's nice, take a walk. Take a walk around your house. Look at the plants that you know that you want in your yard. And see if you don't see something at the base of one of them or right out of the middle of one of them of something that you don't want in your yard. Desert broom is one of those things that you don't want. Next, what is spurge? Spurge is another weed that you definitely don't want in your yard. I'm going to use my hand as an example, but it's down this way. Spurge has a taproot that comes out of the base of the plant, one taproot. And here comes this weed. Spurge spreads like you wouldn't believe. It's a low-growing, creeping weed that, like desert broom, spreads from one yard to another, but it actually spreads faster. You do not want to pull it. Use something to spray it to kill it. Because when you pull it, you get that one taproot, and what does it have on it? A hundred seeds. So for every weed that you pull, for every spurge you pull out of the ground, you're going to get 10 more that are going to grow because you pulled it. Next, if you can get there, hey, there's a large spurge growing at the crack of the yard where it meets the sidewalk. This one isn't green. This one you can see that it not only there's the large one, but it's spread down the sidewalk. Spray it. Get rid of it. It also grows in the crack where the sidewalk meets the apron of the street. Now, some of you may not be familiar with that term. The apron is the curved part of the cement that goes from the flat sidewalk down to the asphalt. It goes there, too. And I could not find a picture, even though I went back to 2012 and all my pictures that I have on my computer, it also grows where the cement meets the asphalt of the street. You need to get it out of there, too, because it will just run down the street, and all your neighbors will not be very happy. This is a yard filled with spurge everywhere, in the river rock, in the yard, over the sidewalk. It needs to be sprayed. I know there's people in the room that um, have a concern about using Roundup or some other product that you can buy that kills weeds. So what I've done is I've put a recipe for weed, for weed killer on a slide. It does work. It's not super expensive to make. And for those of you that don't want to use Roundup, try this. It does get rid of them. You combine those three things, the vinegar, the Epsom salts, and the blue Dawn dish detergent. Don't ask me why it has to be blue, but it does. Combine that up, throw it in a squirt bottle, spray it on the weed, wait a couple days, and it'll go belly up and die. This is a picture of a yard that's gotten weeds in it near the mailbox. That's your responsibility, too. And be kind to your neighbor. If the weeds are on both sides of the pole and you see them, get both of them. Good grief, that's not that hard to do. It not only has tall weeds in the yard, but it's got a hedge. The hedge is too tall. All hedges in the community, whether they're in the front yard, the side yard, the backyard, wherever, have to be no taller than six feet tall. That's a foot taller than I am. I tell people, cut it down to four feet, four and a half feet. You still got your privacy. 
give it a chance to grow. Because depending on what kind of plant it is, if you go away in the spring and you've cut it before you go to Canada or Minnesota or wherever, by the time you get back, it should still be right at not quite six feet tall. If you cut it to six and then go away for ten minutes, I didn't do that. I apologize, especially to those of you like Dave who has a hearing aid in. He's probably going to hang me or not take me out for supper. Sorry. Back to the hedges. Cut them lower than six. Give them room to grow. They will grow, and depending on the type of plant, they'll grow fast. I'm going to use uh, an oleander as an example. An oleander will just go zoom. You cut that baby down to five feet, turn your back, go away for a month, it's six and a half feet tall when you come back. They really grow fast. The definition of a hedge, uh, in our governing documents, it's a fence or a barrier formed by a line of closely placed shrubs and performing a similar function to a screen wall or fence. It doesn't even have to be the same kind of a plant. If they grow together, they're a hedge. This is a picture of an example of an extremely tall hedge. <laughs> and the next one is another extremely tall hedge. Six feet, guys. That's the limit. When we speak of a volunteer plant, a volunteer plant is one that you didn't plant in your yard. Um, a bird put it there, in all likelihood. This is a volunteer bird of paradise growing right out of the base of a desert spoon. You want the desert spoon, that's what you planted in your yard when you had your yard landscaped. Bird of paradises are pretty too, but not growing out of the base of another plant. This is a picture of dead plants. Now, I know this is dead, not dormant. I took the picture a couple years ago. I tell my committee members that this time of the year, you have to be careful because something can look dead, but what is it? It's not dead, it's just dormant. It's waiting for spring to get here. So right now, we've got a lot of plants throughout the community that look a little ragged and dead, but they're not. Next, a javelina had fun in this, had fun in this yard. They not only pulled up the black plastic looking for acorns, but this particular oak tree has a lot of suckers growing from the roots of the tree. There's our friend, the javelina, looking for an oak tree. I'm going to tell a story about my yard. We had an oak tree in the front. It was pretty, but the javelinas thought it was pretty too. And every morning when I'd have to go out to get the paper, I had rocks in the driveway, rocks on the sidewalk, sometimes even rocks in the street. What a mess they made looking for acorns. Finally, Dave agreed with me, and we took the tree down. And the javelinas came back for the next two years, thinking we still had acorns. Occasionally, they'd probably find one, but it, finally they have quit coming by and hunting, so I don't have to any longer put rocks back in my yard. This is a picture of citrus on the ground. Citrus falling off of a tree causes animals to come. You're feeding the javelina. You're feeding the bobcats. This particular tree has some oranges that are laying there that have been there for um, quite some time. I'm going to try walking over here again and hope this microphone behaves. Citrus needs to be picked up, not left on the ground to rot and invite the animals to come for a snack. The next picture shows prickly pear cactus fruit 
on the ground. Again, that doesn't present a neat and tidy appearance. And it's another invitation for some sort of creature that lived here before we ever did to come through and have a feast. So they need to be picked up also. Now we have mesquite beans. As those of you who've lived here for a while know, the mesquite trees have lots of beans that fall off of them. But they all don't fall at the same day. So I tell my committee members, don't write up a yard that has beans on the ground if there's still beans in the tree. Wait till they come down. So if your particular front yard has a mesquite tree in it, that's fine. Try to keep your driveway, the sidewalk leading to your front door, and the sidewalk perhaps in front of your home, depending on where the mesquite tree is, swept of the beans. Then your house doesn't look unoccupied and vacant and be an invitation to a burglar or whoever that drives by and thinks, aha, nobody's been in this driveway for a while or walked to that front door for a while. So keep it cleaned up. and We're not going to write it up until they're all down out of the tree. No sense for you guys to pay a landscaper two months in a row to come clean up beans when they're still up there. This is an olive tree that has suckers. The suckers are growing from the base of the trunk of the tree, and they grow quickly. That tree would probably win first prize for being the tree in the community that grows the fastest suckers in Oro Valley. I happen to watch my neighbor's house in the summertime when she goes back to Spokane, Washington. I have cut suckers out of her off of the base of her tree on Monday because trash day is Tuesday. By next Monday, it looks like that. Looks like I didn't even do anything. Now the tree, the suckers are even taller. Now we get suckers from all the trees. I showed you some on the oak tree, but the olive tree wins the prize. It gets the most, they grow the tallest, the fastest. They need to be cut down. Weed killer does not work on getting rid of suckers. Take your clippers, chop them off. If you have a trellis in your yard, that's fine. And some of us do, because we have certain plants that grow up the trellis. The trellis has to be painted the background color of whatever it's attached to. If it's attached to the house, it needs to be painted as this one is, the color of the house. If attached to a brick wall, it needs to be painted to the color of the brick wall. Just paint it to the background color of where it is attached, and it has to be attached. Can't just be standing out there freestanding. Some of us in the community have a driveway that we've paid a company to come and coat with either just a, a clear color or something with a design in it. And that's fine, it's really pretty, but it does wear off. And the first place it wears is where the entrance to the driveway is from the street. You come down the street, you slow down to enter your garage, you pull into your driveway, you, that's the first place it's gonna chip and wear. After a while, the entire driveway that at once was coated and pretty now is totally worn off and not real pretty, and it needs to be recoded. That's something else our committee looks at. If you decide to uh, do that, it isn't super cheap. Be sure you get a couple of quotes from companies that do that kind of work. Um, because there are more than one, there is more than one company in the community that does that. Get a couple estimates, but make sure you're getting estimates from a company that's licensed, bonded, and insured. Then make your decision who to go with. Next. Oh, 
You weren't supposed to go there till I got here. Excuse me. I forgot. Okay. Hang tight. 15 seconds. If you have any written questions, as I've given my presentation, please write them and pass them now to the end of the row on the outside where you've been sitting. My committee members will pick them up so they may be answered at the end of my presentation. If you have any written suggestions, there's a box on the table in the back where you may place them as you leave the auditorium. Copies of the approved development standards are also available for you to have as you leave if you need one. Or you may get one either online or at the Welcome Center. That is the document that has the approved plant list that's in quotes. Just in case you're thinking about planting a new and different type of plant in your yard. Be sure you check that list prior to purchasing and planting something. If I've piqued your interest with either my talk today or from the pictures that we have shown to you, and if you feel even a little bit like you might be interested in joining our committee this coming spring, we will have some openings. I will be glad to talk to you today, or you may give me a call so that we may get together for a one-on-one -on -one visit where I can tell you a little bit more about what we do on a monthly basis. The time commitment from each person is minimal, about three to four hours a month, including a one-hour monthly training session and meeting. We do touring golf carts, but it's not necessary for all our members to own one. It's nice if our members are full-time residents, but that, too, is not totally necessary. I sincerely hope that a couple of you are interested enough in following up on this committee membership invitation to join the NPC, to help keep pride alive in our neighborhood. We are certainly proud to live here, and we hope that you are too. I want to thank Randy Moody, Pat Howard, and Carol Reed for allowing me to use a couple of their beautiful pictures of the view that we sometimes see as we look at the Catalina Mountains and our beautiful desert. I also would be remiss without taking just a minute to thank Norma Martin, one of our previous NPC members, for her help with my slideshow presentation this afternoon. She and I, along with our entire committee, hope you enjoyed seeing the pictures. Thanks also go to Tom Prawl, who filmed this presentation this afternoon for future use by Sun City Oro Valley. I would like all committee members to stand and be recognized for their hard work each and every month. Please. They're kind of spread about. <laughs> if there are any questions or comments at this time, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Katie. Nice to read them in the order you gave them to me. Doesn't matter. Okay. Got to put them in the light. What decorations can we hang or place on the outside of the house? For instance, coyotes, birds, cactus, southwest decorations, etc. Whatever you hang or attached to the outside of your house is considered wall art. It has to be attached. I don't care what it is. We don't care what it is. The documents don't care what it is. It just needs to be attached to the house. You can't just be standing there leaning up against the wall. 
The next question. Um, if, oh, okay, excuse me. If a homeowner sees a safety issue that the NPC hasn't seen, who do we notify? Who do we notify of a non-safety violation? For example, artifacts or bushes over sidewalks. Well, folks, I'm in the phone book. I get calls all the time. Katie's in her office. She probably gets more than I do. We've never quite kept a tally. I probably get them on the weekends because she doesn't work on the weekends. But you call me. Sometimes I will say this, though. Let's say one of you calls me and says to me, um, there's a penguin that somebody stuck in their front yard. They just moved in. I have a list. I have a copy of the list that each of my committee members took, saw, wrote each month. I will get the address where they're telling me about, and I'll look on the copy of the list that I have, and in all likelihood, the committee's already caught it. If it's still there the next month, the homeowner will get a letter. I will tell the person that's asking the question if I already have the complaint or if I don't. If I don't, I get in my golf cart on the next sunny day when it warms up a tad, or in my car, and I'll drive by to see if I see it. And if it's there, I'll grab another couple committee members to just confirm that I didn't imagine, yeah, it's there. And in that case, we'll write it up and turn it in, and the homeowner will get a, get a letter telling them they can't have that in their yard. 99% of the time, when an artifact appears, it's somebody new who just didn't know. So I don't care. Call me. Call Katie. Let us know. We may already know about it, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of my neighbors, and I already heard this one, said one of the reviewers, in other words, one of my, two of my team members, were using binoculars to view his house. If so, is that overkill or not? <laughs> of course it's overkill. First of all, we don't travel with binoculars. When I heard this the other day, I heard two ladies went by, and both of them had binoculars. Well, I know that my committee members don't have binoculars, but somebody on my committee said, the birders do. Somebody else on my committee said, I saw my first robin the other day. It was not a member of Neighborhood Pride. Please, if you ever see that happen, or your neighbor sees it happen, hop on the horn, give me a call, and tell me where you live, when you saw it, because I know when my team members are out. And by the way, they only go out once a month, somewhere between day one and day 10. So if you saw them out there on the 17th of the month, it sure wasn't anybody from Neighborhood Pride. If you saw them somewhere between day one and day 10, and they're on such and such a street, I can look. I don't just have women on my committee. Right now, I've got four men. Right, four. I had to count for a second. And some of those men ride in a cart with a woman. So I need some more information, but we don't run around with binoculars. Trust me. Um, yes, I frequently drive by a house that does not need to be painted. However, the trim is dated because it's blue. It is powdery and faded. I showed a blue um, a trim on one of my slides. Does trim have to be painted even if the house doesn't need to be painted? Yes. If the trim is faded and crummy looking and the rest of the house looks fine, the trim has to be painted and it has to be painted in an approved current color, which is not blue. In that instance, again, if you'll give me that address after the meeting or call me at home, tell me when, where it is, 
I'll look into it. But yes, if the trim looks bad, and sometimes it's not just the wooden trim, it's the bump out or the, the stucco part of if the house comes down flat and all of a sudden it's got a little place towards the ground, we consider that a bump out. That's a trim color. So um, I just need to know where that is so I can follow up on it. Um, somebody said once, my God, does she know every house in the community? I know most of them, but uh, I need some help on this one, please, guys. I need to know where that is. Do you have any more? Don't run. It's okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Katie, I'm going to let you answer this one. You got a mic? I think you can probably answer it better than me. Do you know how to turn that one on? Okay. Why aren't the notices mailed out promptly after the inspector sees the violation? I received mine two weeks after the inspection. First of all, I'm going to, before I let her answer it, I'm going to tell you that let's do a hypothetical. The team goes by on the 6th. It's a weekend. Um, they might not turn the form in. They might write it over the weekend, but they aren't going to get it to her until 7, 8, 9, which is Monday. Maybe she's got a million other things to do on Monday. She may not get the letter out till the end of the following week. Right? Correct. And it depends on what time of the year also. Um, September, October are perhaps our busiest month as far as writing courtesy notices because of uh, deficiencies with houses, especially because there are weeds. And for instance, this last October, we had 684 weed courtesy notices that went out. Now there's Karen and there's me, and that's basically how it goes. And we have a lot of other duties. So we do the best we can. Um, and that's kind of my answer. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. If suckers and weeds are both seen, why aren't they noted on one sheet and at one time? Again. Whoops. Hello? Okay. We have software right now that is um, older. And um, in the coming years, hopefully, we'll be getting some different software. Because of the software that we have that we use to send out letters, we have codes that we use. And every item that is a deficiency has its own codes, such as weeds, um, suckers, etc. And they all have a number of days that are um, attached to them so that someone can have 15 days to get the weeds taken care of, but they might have two months to get the house painted, as an example. And it's because of those codes that we use with our software that we can't send out a letter that just deals with, I mean, we have to send out a letter that just deals with one code where it would be much better, I agree totally, and it will come, uh, that perhaps has every deficiency if there are three or two or hopefully no more. That's coming. Thank you, Katie. Um, why are satellite, satellite, hang on, I need dishes, forbidden on roofs, but solar panels are okay. Because Arizona statutes are very liberal about solar installations. We cannot tell someone, anyone, that they cannot put solar panels on their roof. That's an Arizona state law. So if solar panels are up there, we can't do anything about that. Satellite dishes, though, we can. We are new to desert plantings. How does the blue-green herbicide impact the cactus. Um, the blue-green herbicide, I'm assuming you're, at, you're talking about not what I had up for a weed thing, but you're talking about the 
Pre-emergent. Pre-emergent. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. I, but that made me think of something, remind me at the end of Tell You a Funny. Given all the rain, in the next week, which is our possession date on our home, is it too late to ward off the weeds? No. The home has been vacant for quite some time. My husband and I have pre-emergence put down in our yard twice a year. We have it done in January before the winter rains. It was done a couple of weeks ago, and the person that puts it down keeps a very close eye on the weather report. It needs to rain X number of days, and I think it's 15 or 18 days after it's put in the yard. It needs to rain to soak down into the yard. We have it done again in July, just before the monsoon season. The funny that I thought of, for those of you that are new, several years ago, I got a phone call at my home very early in the morning that this house on such and such a street had graffiti all over the side of the house. And would I please go look and do something? So I threw on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and went out the door to see what was going on. And I laughed when I got there because the side of the house was indeed blue. But it wasn't graffiti. It's where the pre-emergence had been sprayed in the yard. The wind blew a little bit, and the blue stuff went up on the stucco. Well, a hose will wash it off, or the rain will take it off. It wasn't graffiti, and it wasn't even the lady that owned the house that called me. It was someone taking a walk that saw it and thought we had vandals in the community putting graffiti on our homes. So I hope that answered your question about it's not too late to do something with your yard. We're going to still get some rain. I know you're going to close on your house shortly. If you have um, a pest control company, sometimes they put down pre-emergence. Um, most of your landscapers do, um, and it's not too late to do that. We can certainly tell in late spring and in the summer, as we drive by yards, who's had pre-emergence put down in their yard and who hasn't. Because if Dave and I get, and I'm being very honest here, more than a dozen weeds in a total year in our yard, I'm surprised. But we do put pre-emergence down. It really doesn't keep every weed from coming. And it doesn't keep the guy's spurge that lives next door from creeping down the street. And all of a sudden, I got one in my yard. But it certainly helps. It's worth the money, guys especially if you're gone in the summertime. Have that done to your yard, and you won't hear from us while you're gone and enjoying cooler weather while we're down here where it's warm. I think I've answered all my questions. You gave, no? The one question on there that you didn't respond to was, did the pre-emerge with purple cactus? Oh, and it yeah, correct, I'm sorry. I didn't read that, thank you, Carol. The question was also asked by that particular homeowner if pre-emergent hurts cactus. We all have some sort of cactus in our yard or uh, desert growing plants that don't require any water. No, pre-emergent does not hurt them. Um, and I should say this too, neither does Roundup. I've sprayed Roundup at the base of a cactus. And around the weed died and the cactus lived. I did get one question that you don't want me to answer. Why'd you give it to me? You're supposed to go to Mary Kay. Oh, okay. Read the, if you would read the question and let the people know that it would be Mary Kay. I mean, it's, it's a good question. Okay. Why'd you draw an X through it and make it hard for me to read? <laughs> About the woodpeckers? No. Okay. There was a part to the question. How do we get rid of a woodpecker? Uh, I don't know. I guess you just hope he flies on to the next house. But I will tell you, sticking a fake owl on your chimney to scare off the woodpecker isn't going to work. That's an old wives' tale. Now to the question that I'm supposed to read, which I'm not going to answer, but I'll tell you where to go to get your answer. The work. The wash behind our house has really grown up. It may be a fire hazard. Would Sun City ever take the responsibility? 
Are we talking the wash? We're not talking the five-foot fire line. Okay, let me, let me talk about the five-foot fire line, first of all. There's several lots in the community that back onto property that Mary Kay Cunningham and our common area maintenance men do keep cleared of brush. That's called the five-foot fire line. A little side that's kind of funny was one day I asked her about a specific property, and she said, oh, Tempe, don't worry about it. The five-foot guys are going to take care of it. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, I didn't know you had guys that work on your crew that were my height. She then laughed and said, no, that's not what she was talking about. She's talking about her crew that takes care of the five-foot line behind properties. Now, as far as the wash goes, I think, help me out here, Katie. As far as, Hello? Okay. Hello? As, far as the, the wash goes and the, the wash, um, there are, are forms in my office for, they're com called common area maintenance submittal forms. And um, if you have brush that is growing that needs to be removed, please do not go out and do that or have your landscaper go out and do it. Um, Mary Kay will come uh, after I get the submittal form and she will review the area. She will talk to you about what it is that you want. And there is a process and I'm happy to go through that with you. So all you have to do is come in or you can give me a call and I'll give you the paperwork. Okay. I want to say thank you. Thank you for the questions. I hope I answered them all. I don't think that's too many questions at all. I'm not too surprised that I got a few. I want to thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Have some refreshments, and feel, feel free to talk with me or any of the NPC members who are here this afternoon. Don't forget to pick up a copy of the property maintenance tips as you leave. And again, thank you very, very much for coming.